Members of the Committee, I'd thank you all for coming. And right now I'd like to introduce Stuart Saginor, and I will turn the program over to him. Wow, that was a quick introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow. I, I thought he was going to give me a little more or something. Um, do you folks want to come up? Can you see from all the way in back like that? Because we do have space up here if you want to. You can't hear. You can't hear. Aha. There's nothing I can do except for speak louder. That's it. Um, if you, if, but there are three seats here, and I don't, I don't bite. I know folks don't like to sit in the front row. Um, I'm going to pass around uh, a sign-up sheet, and it's everyone who registered. Just put a check mark if you're here, and if you're not, there's blank lines below. You can fill in your name and your email address, and I'll pass around my cards as well if anyone wants a card. And there's a pen for you. So, um, as Bill said, my name is Stuart Saginaw. I'm the executive director of the Community Preservation Coalition. And what we have for you tonight is sort of an update um, from a bird's eye view of what's happening with CPA across the state. And then some of the, some of the basics real quickly for folks who might be a little new to their CPC. And then into some of the finer points and some of the sticking points that people, and the pain points that people get when they dive into CPA projects. Um, if it's okay with you, Bill, I love to do the presentation interactively and take questions along the way, if that's sure. all right. So just raise your hand, and, um, and I find that's more, more effective. And then afterwards, we can open it up to individual projects that you want to talk about, um, whatever you like. We want to make CPA a better experience for all of you. Um, we have folks here tonight from East Longmeadow, so if you'd raise your hand if you're from East Longmeadow, mostly CPC members, and I think there's town council members and a few others here. Uh, I know we have some folks from Munson as well. Uh, great. And um, Springfield is represented as well. Thank you so much for coming. Hello, Bob. Um, and let's see, uh, Longmeadow is also here. Oh, we got a great crew from Longmeadow. Who am I missing? Any other? Wilbraham. Wilbraham, of course, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, welcome, Wilbraham. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's great to be out here. Um, I'll tell you, this is my favorite part of the job, which is coming to communities and meeting everyone and talking about CPA. So I was miserable for four years, absolutely miserable that I couldn't travel during the pandemic. Um, so now, I'm, according to my wife, I'm overdoing it a little bit um, every week on the road. But um, it, is, it is what I really love. You'll find that I'm a, absolutely a CPA geek. So if you all want to stay right through the end of the Celtics game tomorrow, we'll still talk about CPA uh, continuously. So I did breathe a sigh of relief when I found out it was the Celtics game was tomorrow and not, not tonight. So very excited about that. All right, so let's um, dive in. Um, the organization that I work for is called the Community Preservation Coalition. It's been around for a long time. Um, this was the organization that advocated for a decade to get CPA passed at the state level. And it was not an easy task. I wasn't around then, um, but I did join uh, the program in 2001 as chair of my uh, CPA community. I live up on the North Shore of Massachusetts in a small little town. And I was chair there for five years and loved it so much. I applied for this job in 2006. And that's where I've been since. Um, the coalition is um, in the offices of the Trust for Public Land. We've been there for quite a while. Um, but they pass us off. Uh, early on, we were in Chapa, and then we were at Preservation Massachusetts for a while. But we've been at TPL for about 20 years. And the reason why we love though, that location is it's about two steps from the State House. And we spend a lot of time uh, at the State House. These are the founding organizations. They all sit on our steering committee, representing all the different aspects of CPA. We have a pretty active 21-member steering committee um, with eight folks from CPA communities. For, usually folks are either an administrator from the CPC or CPC members. And then we have seven at-large members as well. And they meet quarterly to kind of guide the advocacy and um, operations of the coalition. Um, and the things we do, I think, are no different than um, other municipal trade associations. Um, if you're on the CONSCOM, you have MACC, the Massachusetts Association of Conservation Commissions, that does education and advocacy and training for you. Uh, there's a moderators association. There's a town council association. Uh, there's MMA for select board and, and town council members. Every different constituency has an organization like ours, and we're the ones for 
CPA communities in the state, and more specifically, the community preservation committees of those CPA communities. And the things we do, I think, are, are typical of all those organizations. The two that I think are the most valuable um, for our communities are our technical assistance. We answer about 4,000 questions a year. It's pretty busy um, by email or phone. Or phone. Um, it's incredible the number of requests we get, not just from CPCs, but media, legislators, researchers, um, college students. Everyone wants to write about CPA because of the great success it's been. So um, unfortunately, there is no state agency that deals with CPA in any way, shape, or form. There's not one employee at the state of Massachusetts that has CPA in their job title. They spend absolutely zero, and I mean not one dollar, on administering the program. They consider it to be a local program. So we are really it in terms of information and website and questions, um, because there's just no one at the state level um, that uh, advocates for or does training or, or um, education on CPA. So our technical assistance is really important. Um, and the other, the other thing I think that I like about our organization is that we really keep on top of what's happening on Beacon Hill. Um, and you're not gonna do that on your own. You're not gonna throw on your, your suit um, or a coat and trek to Boston and sit there for four hours during a hearing and then advocate on a bill that kind of does some harm to CPA. But that's what we do on your behalf. Um, and it's both sort of offensive, keeping with the Celtics theme, it's offensive and defensive. Um, we're advocating for changes to the program that CPA communities have requested. Um, and there's been about 11 different amendments that have passed um, after our advocacy work with everyone's help across the state to make CPA better and more flexible. But unfortunately, there are a dozen or sometimes two dozen bills filed every session, usually by um, folks who are not in a CPA community who kind of want to um, change the program for their benefit. Um, and so we have to spend a lot of time up at the legislature educating them and talking about those bills and explaining how, how CPA works. Um, and so we spend a lot of time uh, at the legislature working on those things. Um, that you're looking at 50% of the coalition staff. Um, the other 50% is right here, Chase Mack. Um, Chase is our communications director. Um, this is when Milton was on the ballot and he and his wife went down during the pandemic, as you can tell, and uh, stood and held signs on election day in Milton, which was a, a, successful, a successful vote. Um, very lucky for our steering committee chair. He was very embarrassed. He's been on our steering committee for 20 years and his hometown didn't have CPA. Um, but this was a critical election for us, and that's probably why Chase chose to campaign that day in, uh, in Milton. I was in Framingham, actually, that day. Um, and we are just about to hire a legislative and research director as well. So we'll be back up. We had three staff people, and then the pandemic, uh, we chose to wait until the pandemic was over to, to ramp up again. Um, one uh, housekeeping announcement I'll make. You see, in the corner of uh, some of these slides, there are about 10 of what we call bookmarks. If you are registered um, for this um, on that sheet, tomorrow morning you're getting an email from Chase. It's gonna have a copy of this presentation. And then these bookmarks will have links in Chase's email that lead to more information on our website. So if you wanna learn more about what we do, um, that would be the bookmark to follow. And you'll see those throughout the night. Um, as we do this presentation. Um, folks always ask how we fund ourselves. Um, we fund ourselves like any other nonprofit with a request to foundations and those six nonprofit partners. But 80% of our um, revenue that we get to run the coalition comes from you folks, from dues paid by CPA communities completely voluntarily. Um, it is not a requirement of CPA to join the coalition and support us, but we're really, really pleased that 99.9% .9 of all CPA communities uh, that are eligible to join and have an administrative budget have joined. So thank you for your support. Uh, we really wouldn't be able to be uh, here uh, and doing things like this without it. All right, so um, hopefully a lot of you have seen our, our website, and I wanna call your attention particularly to one page on our website, this technical assistance tab here on our website, that's for you folks. That has, um, opens up this big menu. It looks nice and neat, um, but you start digging in there, you're gonna find hundreds of pages of articles and information 
and um, questions and answers and documentation and examples and PDFs and all sorts of things. I don't know if we've ever taken anything off our website in 24 years. We just keep adding and keeping it updated. Um, so if you ever have a question on CPA, feel free to um, look here first. And then if you don't find the answer, give us a call or, or shoot us an email. Uh, but this website I think you'll find is, is very helpful. So CPA has been a huge success. Um, we're in over half the communities in the state now um, in, in less than uh, uh, 22, 23 years or so. Um, that's pretty incredible um, that, that that many communities have been willing to join the program. Um, in recent times, the cities have really come into the program. They're a little slower on the uptake. Um, it's much harder to get uh, CPA passed in a city with the diverse uh, socioeconomic uh, status of, of folks that might live in a city. It's a little tougher. Most cities have not had ever voted successfully for overrides or additional funding. Um, in a lot of cases, CPA is the only um, override, so to speak, that a, a city has ever voted on. But um, in the past decade, it's really been the cities that have been adopting CPA. So Springfield um, was not too long ago. Um, Chelsea, Fall River, New Bedford, Salem, Beverly, uh, Holyoke, um, Westfield, uh, Pittsfield, all these cities, um, some of them gateway cities, some of them um, uh, suburban to Boston, around the state, we've had a tremendous response from the cities. And because of that, we've raised the number of people that live in a CPA community. So now almost three quarters of the state residents live in a CPA community. Um, we're all really proud of this, and you should all be proud of this too, the fact that no one has ever exited the program who adopted CPA. Um, it's, that's an incredible track record. 196 communities are in, and not one of them has felt that they wanted to be out of the program, that they didn't find it useful. And that's because of all the amazing work that you do and the projects that you do um, it proves to the residents that CPA is absolutely worth it. It's only been on the ballot four times to revoke CPA. Um, three a decade ago in Hingham, Sturbridge, not too far from here, and Northampton, soundly defeated in all three cases. Um, and then this past spring, uh, the town of Groveland, which is right next door to me, also had a revocation vote and again, the citizens soundly said, nope, we want to continue paying this surcharge. We like what the town does with this money and the, and the projects they do. I don't know if we'd be able to say that forever. Um, hopefully it's not one of the five towns that are represented here today that make me have to put a one on there. Um, but it's a, it's a tremendous rack, uh, track record. So here's what the map of CPA communities looks like in the state. The green are the towns and the orange are the cities. Um, the little stars are the communities that have CPA on the ballot for this November, for the presidential election. You would have thought after 24 years, all the communities that, had, that would have wanted to have CPA would have already adopted. But yet here we have eight more communities. And remember, it's only you know, a small percentage, you know, 40 or so percent of the communities in the state that don't have it. And we have eight of those that are interested in CPA, and two more are collecting signatures. Uh, Townsend and Colrain are collecting signatures right now, so they'll definitely be on the ballot as well. You can get on the ballot by a legislative body vote, or you can collect 5% of the registered voters. Um, I don't think I've memorized these eight yet. They all got on the ballot within the past three weeks at town meetings, um, but that's Clarksburg, that's Sheffield, Rutland, and Spencer, or Spencer and Rutland, sorry about that. Um, Winchester, uh, Halifax, and I'm drawing a blank here on these two. <laughs> so I'll figure it out. It'll come to me and I'll just shout it out in the middle of my presentation. Um, but um, it, it's gonna be an exciting season to have uh, that, that, that many communities on the ballot. That's Sherborne. Um, so I'm just missing here. Oh, no, that is Winchester and that is Swampscott. I got them all. Um, Swampscott is where Charlie Baker used to live. Um, and when he was on the, uh, long before he was Charlie Baker of Harvard Pilgrim fame or governor fame, 
he was on the select board in Swampscott in 2001, and CPA came up for a vote, um, and he voted to put it on the ballot, but it failed. Um, and so now he's been through the eight years of governorship. We still couldn't get Swampscott on board, but finally they are, are voting on it this year. Phil, you had a question? Sure. Why does it seem like it it seems to be slow in Western Yeah, great question. Um, I could talk about this map all night. There are so many CPA stories buried on this map, um, but that's one of them. Why the, the big white area here and the big white area here? Um, I don't know for sure, but I have a, a guess on each of them, and they're different reasons. Um, for these communities, which we call the highlands of Massachusetts, they're all really tiny. Um, and so it would be very tough to even staff a CPC. You know, the same 20 people do everything in town. And the amount of money they would generate would be really tiny. Um, so I think that's why you haven't seen a lot of organizing there in those communities. Here, um, the only thing that we can attribute this to is it's a much more conservative part of the state. You know, CPA is a tax increase. Um, if you think about it, it's pretty incredible that in every one of these communities that is um, on the map, the majority of the voters at one point stepped into the voting booth and voted themselves a voluntary tax increase. I mean, think about that for a second. That 196 communities said, yep, we like this program. We're going to voluntarily raise our own taxes. And some of them by 3%, which is not an insignificant amount. Um, and that's just a little a tougher, um, it seems like, to happen here in the central part of the state because it's a little more conservative. But there's been a lot of activity you know, this is around the edges are where a lot of the CPA activity has been recently. So it is, it is better than it was. And of course, you can see we have two communities right in the heart of it there. Um, I think the fact that Worcester passed CPA two years ago um, and is ramping up their program right now uh, will really help that part of the state learn more about the program. So great question. All right, um, any way you look at this program, whether you look at that map or you look at the statistics that are on the screen right now um, showing you what's happened with the money, you can see the huge success this program has had. Um, the number that I think is, is just uh, blows me away every time I say it is this one right here. In, in just over 22 years, CPA has generated $3.4 billion in funding for four restricted tight categories. Think about that for a second. $3.4 billion in just over two decades. Um, that's incredible. Every year, CPA now generates across the state between the local money and the state money between $240 and $300 million every single year uh, because we have these 196 communities and a lot of them bigger cities as well. Um, Historic preservation is the most popular part of the program in terms of numbers of projects, not necessarily in terms of money. The money actually rolls up pretty evenly across the four categories statewide. Um, but historic preservation, you know, the projects tend to be a little bit smaller and more frequent. Um, we're approaching 40,000 acres of open space um, that has been uh, protected with CPA. This is definitely the hottest category of CPA in the past um, eight years or so. Uh, there was some legislation that we worked on. Uh, actually, the biggest rewrite of CPA was back in 2012. A lot of changes made to make it more flexible for the existing CPA communities. And one of them really made outdoor recreation much easier to rehabilitate your existing parks, playgrounds, athletic fields, community gardens, trails. And so we've seen the number of projects skyrocket in this, in this category right here since that legislation was changed. And this is arguably the biggest problem we have here in the Commonwealth, um, more so in the eastern part of the state and out here, but out here as well. Um, and we're closing in on 30,000 units. These stats are about a year old. They're through the end of FY23, and we're just three weeks away from the end of FY24. So all these numbers will take a big jump um, uh, when we get the data from the state in the fall on what communities have done in, in FY24. All right, so the money is always where I kind of lead up at the front, because everyone's always interested, obviously, in the money. Um, it makes the world and CPA go round. Um, there are two main funding source and one tertiary funding source with CPA. Of course, the biggest amount of money is raised every year through your local property tax surcharge. Whatever your community adopted, whether it's 
Um, half a percent, we have two communities that have half a percent, um, and the rest are anywhere from one to three percent. Um, that's your local surcharge money, and that's a, a surcharge on top of everyone's tax bill with exemptions. Um, and then the magic of CPA is this annual trust fund distribution um, that happens every fall. And we'll talk about a little bit more about that um, on the next couple of slides. So these are your two main funding sources. One thing we always point out to folks is that the law does require that um, cities and towns pay the interest attributable to the fund balance of CPA to the CPA account. So if you have you know, $600,000 in your reserve accounts and your general undesignated fund balance, um, you are earning interest on that. It's not a separate bank account you know, at TD Bank like you and I have. Um, it's commingled with the, with the town's other free cash, um, but the town is required to track how much interest is attributable to the CPA portion and pay that into um, your CPA account when they close the books every summer. I emphasize this because um, for the first time ever, we were finally able to convince DOR to put some of the forms that your town submit to CPA online. Um, it was very hard to access what's called the CP2 form, which is all the data. It's the profit and loss statement that your town submits every year to DOR, and it would go into a black hole there, and no one could see it. And we finally got DOR to put that on their website, and we now slice and dice that on our website. And when we looked at it last year, when it, in the December, when it finally came to us, we saw communities were not get, some communities were not getting interest. Now, it might be that their town you know, is very conservative and is not investing that money, um, but more likely the town doesn't realize that this is part of the law and the CPC has never brought it to their attention. So we always tell you to check and make sure this is happening. Um, and there's a report on our website going back 20 years now from DOR, and it'll show you town by town whether you're getting this interest or not and how much it is. Um, but that should be paid into your CPA fund and, and worth checking on. Um, and we have found communities in the past who have discovered it, and they can go back one fiscal year, you know, the current fiscal year, and pay you your interest, but previous year's interest, it's, it's gone. So you want to check that out. All right, so now let's talk about the trust fund. Um, and this really is, like I said, the, the magic of CPA. Um, and the money doesn't come from where most folks think it comes from. Most folks, if you ask them, where does the money for the CPA trust fund come from? And it you know, can be anywhere from you know, 50 to $80 million a year. Um, they would say it came from the general fund, you know, from the budget that the legislature passes every year. But it's much better than that. Um, from our perspective. It's a the funding comes from a dedicated fee on top of every document filed at any registry of deed in Massachusetts. So when you go to record a mortgage or a declaration of trust or an order of, order of conditions from your CONSCOM to put in a new pool, you go to the registry or your lawyer goes to the registry and files that document, and there's a chart at the window, and it says to file a deed, it costs $185. To file a articles of trust, it's $225. $50 of each one of those charges goes to the CPA trust fund. Um, municipal lien certificates, that one document, are $25. I don't know why, but they are. Um, but the rest of them, $50 of every document filed anywhere in the state at the registry goes to the trust fund. And it is a true trust fund. It goes from the window at the registry to an account at the Department of Revenue, which is called the CPA Trust Fund. And the only thing that can happen with that money, statutorily, is for DOR to pay it out to your communities every November 15th as a match. It would take an act of the legislature to do anything else with that money. Um, that was a big part of our advocacy work from 2000 to 2010. Um, the trust fund had built up a big surplus, and everyone was filing bills to grab that money for something else. And so we were scrambling all over the state house for a decade, uh, you know, trying to beat back successfully um, all of those attempts. The trust fund does not run a surplus anymore um, because we have so many communities, and the real estate market has declined so dramatically that now it pays out virtually everything that's in the account every single year as a match to communities. Um, so um, that's where the majority of the money from the trust fund comes in. Now, 
when this legislation was first passed in 2000, these fees were actually lower. It was $20 and $10 for municipal lien certificates. And it was that way from the beginning of CPA, when we had 37 communities the first year, all tiny ones that first adopted, all the way till 2019, when we had you know, 175 communities and we had Boston and all these other large communities that had joined. And so the match used to be 100% the first six years. DOR is projecting 14% this year. Um, now, we saw this trend starting to happen as early as 2007 and started advocating at the legislature for them to raise this fee from 20 to 50. It took until 2019 for them to agree to do that. Um, and the next four years up until uh, this year were pretty darn good, again, because of the increase. Um, during that period that we couldn't get the legislature to act on that, they did say to us, look, we love CPA. Almost every legislator has a CPA community or multiple ones in their district. Um, we want to help. Uh, we can't raise the fee right now. It's not the right time. It's never the right time to raise fees and taxes. But we'll start putting money from our state budget surplus into the trust fund every November where we have a surplus. And so in nine out of the last 12 years, we've gotten money from the state budget surplus. And that's this other funding source for the trust fund. Um, that is not automatic. It requires us to go advocate for that for a six month period starting in March all the way through the fall. Um, and it's hard uh, because you know shaking money loose from the legislature is really hard. Um, every special interest group, every constituency would love to have a funding source like this. There are very few dedicated funding sources that are not subject to appropriation by the legislature. Um, but that's one, and we're very lucky to have it. Um, this hasn't been great the past two years. We didn't get any surplus money last year. We're not going to get any surplus money this year. There is no surplus right now. The state is in a little bit of a tough, tough uh, downturn. It looks like it may be turning up, so maybe we'll have some luck next year with that. Um, we'll keep asking for it and pressing every year, um, but that has not been a, a terrific funding source. And that's unfortunate because this funding source is down dramatically as well because of what's going on at the Registry of Deeds. So collections year to date are down about 10%. That's not bad. Last year, if I was standing here in June, I would have said collections are down about 35% last year from the year before. So you all know what's happening in the real estate market, right? There is very little inventory on the market. Very few houses are selling. And so very few fees are being collected at the registry. Um, CPA, the trust fund actually made more money from refinancings over the first 20 years than it did from sales of homes. Um, you know, that's when interest rates were on a long, steady decline, right? Um, and you remember, I don't know, maybe you don't remember, but you know, when, Back in 2003, four, five, six, interest rates were just plummeting, and people would refinance in January. The rates would drop a point and a half. They'd refinance again in June, and they'd drop another point, and they'd refinance again in, in December. And that was ka-ching, ka-ching for the trust fund. Um, it just generated a ton of money, um, and then that's why the match was 100% for six years, and it was pretty high after that as well. Uh, but those days are long since gone. No one is refinancing now, right? Everyone has an interest rate better, we hope, than what's on the market right now. Um, so the surplus funds you know, are, are not going to be able to come to the rescue like they have nine out of the last 12 years. And unfortunately, DOR just you know, announced this figure. They are always a little conservative um, because you don't know what the next five months are going to bring from the real estate market. It's very hard to do a projection on what the real estate market's going to do. Um, uh, so I expect it'll be, you know, a couple percentage points higher maybe than this figure. Um, but that all depends upon what the, happens with the real estate market. I'm hoping we're at a bottom here um, and that when the interest rates start to drop, real estate activity picks up and then the trust fund should pick up as well. Uh, but we'll, it will remain to be seen. Uh, that's not something any of us can control, right? All right. Any questions on the money piece? All right, great. So let's talk about the CPCs and what you folks do um, and sort of give a little refresher and then some of the, the finer points. Um, these are basically the, the main things um, that a CPC is responsible for on an ongoing basis. Um, 
you, you do, and hopefully you all do this, um, have, uh, have to have one public hearing a year to get input from the public on what they want you folks to be working on and what priorities they see for CPA in their community. And then you take that information and you update your CPA plan. Um, hopefully you have a CPA plan. I do find that some communities that have had CPA for, for a long time maybe missed this step along the way. Um, but it is required that you have a CPA plan. Um, we have great examples on our website. Feel free to beg, borrow, and steal. We, we try to put them on the website in Word so you can cut and paste. You know, um, I'd like to say that they're all unique, but you know, after 190 of these, you know, there are some great themes in there and great ideas in other communities that you're more than welcome to, to borrow as you either update or prepare your first um, CPA plan. Um, the other thing that's important to do, and some communities are better at this than others, is to make sure that you get regular financial reporting from your finance department in your town. Um, you know, a lot of CPCs, I'm surprised um, at uh, how little information they're given by their town on what is in their account balances. Um, and you'd think it'd be pretty simple, but it gets complicated really fast with the reserve accounts, the fund balance, the budgeted reserve, all the projects from previous years that are still going on, money that's been turned back, the administrative fund, interest, people who pay their taxes two years late, and there's a CPA piece on that. It can get pretty complicated. Um, Hopkinton had to hire a forensic accounting firm um, to analyze their books and figure out what their CPA balance was. Royalston has not done CPA projects in two years because the CPC can't get a financial report from their town on what's in their accounts. Um, finally, the town hired an outside accounting firm who's getting a handle on it, and Royalston will start doing projects again. But um, I applaud the CPC for kind of you know, doing that um, and saying to the town, you know, we can't in good conscience recommend projects until you tell us what's in the accounts. Um, so um, if you're not getting regular reports, you know, on the same um, schedule that a department head would get, you know, your DPW director gets a report. I don't know if it's once a week, once a month, once every quarter, the CPC should get a report. Um, I will warn you that Municipal finance reports are a little bit more complicated to read than our bank statement. Um, and so I always recommend that a CPC have one person who spends an hour with a town accountant and really understands that report. And then they take it and they transfer it to a spreadsheet that all of us can read and then present it to the CPC. So some communities you know, call that person a financial liaison. Some call it a treasurer, but that's really a misnomer because the CPC has no fiduciary responsibility. Um, but it is a good if someone's kind of keeping an eye on that and making sure that that information is coming from the town finance department. And then these last two are the real meat and potatoes of what CPCs do. They recommend a budget every year to a town meeting or the city council, and they make uh, project recommendations on how to spend uh, the money. So those are the two main reasons that you exist. So the annual budget, um, what's great about CPA is even though it's a restricted fund, it doesn't have a lot of restrictions within those restrictions on how you spend your money. There's really only one in terms of the budget, and that is every year you must spend or reserve for later spending 10% of your total revenue for that year in each of these three categories. And what sometimes people miss is the nuance, it's either spend or reserve for later spending. You don't have to do both. So if you have a historic project that's worth more than 10% of your budget for that year, you don't have to then put another 10% in your historic reserve. Um, the reason why it might be good to put it in first and then pull it out is that what happens if town meeting turns down that project? Now you're in violation because you, you, you were counting on that project to be your 10%. So as a best practice, we recommend that you do put 10% in each and then pull that money out of the reserve accounts when you, when you need to use it. Um, so there's a housing reserve account. The open space and recreation categories share a reserve account. When we say open space in CPA, we mean conservation land. So projects that take place, usually it's acquiring conservation land. Um, you know, land as close as possible to its natural state. 
Recreation is active recreation. Parks, playgrounds, athletic fields, community gardens, things, trails, things like that. Um, they share a reserve account. It's a long, complicated story as to why. Um, I'll answer it if you folks are interested, or we can talk about that later. Um, but that's the reality there. Um, so you can fulfill that requirement by spending 10% on a conservation land purchase or fixing up a park. Steve, do you have a question? Yeah, I do. I, I think I know the answer to this, but I have to ask it anyway. In our town, um, we have money that's been accumulated over the years. Uh, we've got about 
the no. funding? Like, what's the mechanics of that? It's like? very rare that towns are actually building this housing themselves. It's almost never happens. Um, it's the town is funding a community development corporation, a nonprofit developer, a for-profit developer. Um, the housing authority might be building more units, although that's kind of rare as well. Um, so the town, let's say there's a project in Springfield, um, and it needs a lot of money, and some of the surrounding towns decide to invest in that, the CPC would um, sign a grant agreement with whoever was developing that project and give the money directly to the developer. Um, so the town of the city of Springfield would have no party to that. It's a you know uh, a private, for profit or profit, uh, company building it, and the community would be supporting that development. So, good, great question actually. Um, all right. So, um, any other questions on this part of the budget? What, yeah. What do they consider affordable housing? It's housing occupied by someone who earns less than 100% of the area-wide median income for your community. So the Department of Housing and Community Development publishes a chart of what the average family of four earns in your community. We take that chart because um, they do it by regions, like Massachusetts is divided into 12 big regions, and everyone in that region has the same median income. We take that chart, and on our website, we have a spreadsheet with 351 lines on it, and we show you the exact dollar figures for every size household, a, a, a person, a family of one, family of two, family of three, family of four, the chart goes up to eight. And we show you the exact figures that would qualify for affordable housing in your community. So um, most affordable housing programs will only, the state, Federal will only fund up to 80% of the area-wide median income, but CPA can go up to 100%, which is, which is good because a lot of times people who work in a community as firefighters or policemen or teachers, they earn more than you know, the lowest income, but they still can't afford to buy a home in that community. So the fact that CPA can go a little higher, what we call moderate income, is, is great. So CPA is not just for low income, it's for low and moderate income folks. And the numbers are on our website. So, great question. Stuart, is yeah. there any type of housing that would fall under that category? Um, in terms of new construction, you so mean? Or? it's not you know, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Anything as long as there's a deed restriction on that unit that it was going to be occupied um, by someone under 100% of the area-wide me median income. So it could be a condo, it could be, we've had group homes, you know, that are staffed and people with um, um, disabilities live there. We've had veterans homes, we've had single family homes, apartment buildings, housing authority, uh, public housing, um, all different types of housing built with CPA. And the only thing is, the person living in it has to earn less than 100% of the area-wide median income. If they do, you can fund it. So, Karen. Okay. You might have answered this question at another time, but when you look at the, the area median income for 80%, 100%, and then you look at the, the, the half fees, there's like a difference between their 80% and the CPA's 80%. Yes. So that is just always stumbled. I've stumbled over that, like yeah. which one yeah. should. Um, that is a quirk of the CPA legislation. Um, HUD, anyone ever dealt with a? I said HAP. I meant HUD. HUD. Anyone ever dealt with HUD? I mean, talk about red tape federal bureaucracies. HUD is the champion. This, this gentleman over here has had some dealings with HUD. <laughs> they are the champion. And, and the way worse. they have 100%, which is the average of what someone earns in every metropolis in the, in the country, and you'd think for low income, 80%, they would take that number and multiply it times 0.8. You know, take out a little calculator. Really, the cheapest calculator would do that calculation <laughs> times 0.8. That's 80%. But no, they build the 80% number using 500,000 data points, you know, on a gigantic spreadsheet and calculate 80%. And it is not 20% less than 100%. Right. CPA legislation, unfortunately, probably through bad drafting, said that CPA shall calculate 80% by taking HUD's area-wide median income and multiplying it times 
Um, so don't worry about it. No one has ever gone to jail from letting someone live in there with the wrong 80% figure. So the problem is that um, every CPA housing development has used dozens of funding sources. There's never enough money. Housing is expensive. You're not going to fund 100% of a housing unit with CPA or any other program, frankly. So each of these programs that puts money into that housing unit has their own rules, right? And it comes, becomes very difficult. So if you're in a situation where there's other money that has to adhere to HUD's 80%, just go with it. Don't worry about it. Um, we're going to get that fixed. That's one of the changes we're going to propose next year is to align ourselves with HUD. So the reason why I'm asking is we have our historic homes program, and part of it is scale. So when we talk about 80%, I'm looking at the HUD figure but the 100% is the CPA. So right. that's why, like, I don't know. Just pick one. Pick one? Just pick one. <laughs> All right. Just pick one we'll pick and go the with it. One. Yep. Okay. Just pick, pick one and go with it. Um, trust me, it, it will be just fine. It's a quirk in the legislation. It's impossible to adhere to both rules. Um, and we'll get that fixed. Yeah, we should probably not focus all just on housing yet because we're still in the budget part. But yeah, one last um, housing thing, as long as we're talking about <laughs> the nitty-gritty of housing. Does that, what's the practical impact of needing to be under a certain income limit? Uh, does that mean you're only creating rental property, or could you do like a Habitat for Humanity house? Oh, absolutely. Where the homeowner is qualified? Mm -hmm. And what happens if that person's income changes? Yeah. Um, so it's up to 100%. Habitat usually caps themselves at 30%. They're for the very low income. That's perfectly fine. Um, and, um, you know, we have various developments have, you know, it's a 100-unit development, and 25 units are for 30% or lower. Another 20 units are for 50% or lower. Another 20 units are for 80%. And you know the rest are 100. percent You can every development is different. Um, as far as the question of what happens when you go in earning underneath, and then you earn more, if it's a um, homeowner, if you own the property, that's not a problem. They want you to you know earn more. Um, but when you go to sell it, you have to sell it to someone else who's income eligible. Um, uh, on rentals, there are some rules about that, but I'm sorry, I don't know the details of how that works. Um, and it might vary according to what funding source there is. But there are some rules as to whether people have to be requalified every year or every three years. Um, I think it's different for public housing, like housing authorities versus a private development. I don't know the answer to that question, but someone knows the answer because it comes up a lot. So, all right. So continuing on with the budget, just to give an example of how this works, that chart works. Um, if a community had a $500,000 budget, meaning their total of their local money and their state money equal the 500,000, they would be required to either spend 50,000 in each of the categories or put the 50,000 in their reserve account. Um, you can also set aside up to 5% of your total revenue every year for an administrative bu budget for the CPC. Um, we definitely recommend that you do that. Um, and there's no harm in doing that because whatever you don't use, and most CPCs don't use nearly all of their administrative fund, whatever you don't use automatically goes back into your CPA fund at the end of the year, and town meeting or the city council gives you a new 5% administrative budget. It's not like the town budget, whereas if a department has money left in their budget, if the DPW has money left in their budget at the end of the year, that's it. They lose it. It goes back into the town's free cash. But with CPA, no money ever transfers out of CPA to any other town account. So that's why it's not really a danger to allocate the first full 5%. You never know what's going to happen during the year where you might need it. Let's say in this example, just to make it easy, the town's pretty new in CPA and doesn't have any projects that year. So they would have 325000 at the time that the budget is being done in the spring. Remember, in the spring, we do the next year's budget, right? So right now, we're doing budgets for FY25. <clears throat> they would have 325000 that they weren't putting in any type of account. And because of the way municipal finance works in Massachusetts, you really want to recommend, as part of the budget, 
that town meeting appropriate, I'm sorry, transfer that 325,000 to something called the budgeted reserve. What, and it might be a smaller amount. Let's say you had 300,000 in project recommendations, you only had 25,000 that you weren't doing anything with. Your budget would request that 25,000 go to the budgeted reserve. And the reason you do that is, um, and this is municipal finance, this is not a CPA rule. It works the same for your city and town budget. Um, it's fine to have unallocated money from the beginning of the fiscal year on July 1st until the town sets its tax rate, which usually happens in November or December. At that point, you are locked into what's in your budget. Any money that has not been tucked into a project account or appropriated for a project or put in a reserve account, that money is unavailable to you for the entire rest of the fiscal year. It'll come back to you when the town closes its books that summer. But if you leave that 325,000 just as anticipated revenue, the tax rate is set in your town in December, and then in January, Farmer Johnson passes away and his kids put the property up for sale and you wanna have a special town meeting in February and buy that farm, and you don't have the money, you can't access that 325. So that's because, not the same as undesignated then? No, it is not, it is not. The budgeted reserve is a temporary account just for a fiscal, a full fiscal year. And if you don't use that 325 by the end of the fiscal year, it drops into your fund balance. So the fund balance is all the unspent money from all your previous fiscal years that keeps dropping so in there. you have to directly request that money? No. You have to request that it goes into the budgeted reserve, but your town will automatically close out the budgeted reserve when they close the books at the end of every summer. So. Um, if they're doing it right, they'll take that 325 and put it in your fund balance. If they're doing it right, if you only spend 20,000 of your administrative fund, they'll take the 5,000 and put it in the fund balance. Um, if some projects don't happen at town meeting and that money was never spent, they'll put that in the fund balance. So that happens automatically at the end of the year. And you can check on that by asking for a copy of that CP2 form I talked about, because that's that's where the town files with DOR how they closed out the books on your CPA account. All right, any questions on the budget? All right, so now let's talk about the fun part, which is um, spending CPA funds. Um, folks always ask, well, who can apply for CPA funds? The legislation is completely silent on that. It says absolutely nothing about who can apply for CPA funds. But some themes have come up. You know, the two that are the most common, you know, 95% of all applications come from either the municipality itself or a department or a committee in the municipality or a 501c3 nonprofit that works on recreation, historic preservation, owns a historic museum, um, is a land trust and owns conservation land, um, or a, a, a nonprofit housing developer, for example. Um, but CPCs, you know, more often than not, will receive other types of groups applying for funds. And the, the legislation doesn't say no, but we just urge some caution because it deserves an extra level of scrutiny. So the first thing is non-incorporated entities. Um, and I think of Springfield more like this because um, a lot of communities have loosely organized neighborhood groups or neighborhood associations. And they're not 501c3s, they're not incorporated, um, but they may have a checking account that Mary manages, you know, and they may do flower plantings in the, in the public garden, you know, in the middle of their, their neighborhood. Well, you can't, municipalities cannot cut a check to anyone that doesn't have a federal tax ID number. They can't just give the money to Mary and say, hey, yeah, yeah put it in your account, we trust you. Um, so a non-incorporated entity would be pretty much a non-starter, not because of CPA rules, but because of state uh, procurement rules, basically. Um, some communities, um, and again, Springfield gets, gets the uh, credit for being examples here, um, you know, want to help individual um, um, homeowners of historic homes, usually. Um, that's um, a very complicated and difficult process. Um, I only know of three communities that do that. Um, Cambridge has been doing it since the very beginning of CPA. They have a six-person paid professional staff in their historic commission. 
No one else has that, even Boston. Um, so they know what they're doing with that. Um, and then the world-renowned expert on how to do this is sitting right here from Springfield, Karen, who has started a program with her CPC's um, help in Springfield. Are you learning a lot about? Um, we tweak it every year. Yeah. Um, and it's it's almost at the sweet spot. Right yeah, now. great. And um, how many bottles of hair color did it take you to? to, to, to Four. All the gray. Four. All the gray that Karen's got from doing that program. Um, so. Um, you know, there are some models. We have uh, profiles of, of the Springfield program and the Cambridge program on our website, but it's not for the faint of heart. It's, it's a complicated process, as Karen will tell you. Um, and then the other one is privately owned historic buildings, not by necessarily by nonprofits, but buildings that are owned by commercial buildings that are, might be a historic commercial building downtown owned by a developer who rents it to offices and stores and religious institutions. Um, neither of those are exempt from receiving CPA funds. It's absolutely fine. But there's a right way and a wrong way to do it, particularly with religious institutions, because we had a lawsuit that the only CPA lawsuit that went all the way to the state's Supreme Judicial Court. Um, and their ruling just made things 50% more complicated, uh, unfortunately. It was a very unsatisfactory ruling, because uh, it left more questions than it had it answers. So this is a tough one. We just recommend you send those applications to your town council and let them um, let you know whether they're OK or not. We do have some great examples of you know, downtown improvement, facade on historic buildings in downtown. Lowell has a great program where they're giving money to commercial people who own buildings downtown, but they're beautiful. And they really contribute to the character of downtown. Have you done any of that in Springfield? Um, Fall River has done a lot of that. Yes. Yeah, great. Yes. So if you do something like that, let's say, you know, in the center of our town, we've got a historic commercial building. Yep. And we're willing to give them money to redo it. Do you have to put a deed restriction on it? You don't have to, but you should. Um, there's something which is on this slide right here that identifies that. So it's not a CPA rule, but we do have something in Massachusetts called the Anti-Aid Amendment. And it's, an, it's not a law. It's actually an amendment to our state's constitution. It's from 1853. Um, and basically what it says is, it says no money can be spent on, pro no public money can be spent on private assets. That's actually what it says. And it was put in place when all the Irish Catholics were coming to America to flee the famine. And the folks who lived here already wanted to make sure the Irish Catholics you know, stayed as bricklayers and, and laborers and didn't want them to be educated and didn't want public money going to support their religious schools, Irish Catholic schools. And it was done by a, a party we used to have in Massachusetts called the Know Nothing Party. Believe it or not, that's what it was called. Um, and that is still on the books. It's very hard to get a constitutional amendment changed. Now, it's been interpreted in the courts to be a little bit more flexible than that. And basically what it says is, any expenditure of public funds must be used to advance a public purpose. So you can't use public money to a private organization for a private purpose, but you can give public money to a private organization to accomplish a public purpose. Uh, purpose. So the example I give is my town every year gives 3,500 of our municipal budget to the Help for Women and Abused Children program. And in turn, that program agrees that if anyone calls needing help from my town, they will help them with their hotline. Um, so that is public money going to a private organization, but they're using it to fulfill a public purpose. The most common public purpose for CPA is getting preservation restrictions on historic buildings. So when you give money to, getting back to your example, that commercial developer who has a historic building or a nonprofit that has a historic museum, um, you would ask for a preservation restriction back in return. And the city or town would own that preservation restriction, keeping that building looking historic. In most cases with commercial developments, you do what's called a facade um, restriction just on the front because the rest of the building or the interior is not really visible to the public. You just want to make sure that the facade stays looking great and they don't paint it pink um, or put vinyl siding on it after you've given them money to fix it up. Um, and that's, you're doing that 
restriction, not because of CPA requiring it, but to fulfill the anti-aid amendment. Yep. And there are other ways to fulfill the anti-aid amendment. You know, some, some projects, a restriction really is hitting, you know, a little tiny brad nail with a sledgehammer. You know, it's just, it's a $10,000 project to fix the front steps of the Historical Society Museum. Um, you'll spend $10,000 on legal fees doing a preservation restriction, you know. So there are other ways to, to do it as well, um, you know, um, and your town council can help you steer through that. Some communities, there's a great example on our website, Great Barrington does what's called clawback agreements. So they don't do a preservation restriction on tiny projects, but they do have a, um, a contract, you know, a grant agreement, which you should have any time you're giving public money to a private group. And the grant agreement says if you ever sell the building, change the exterior, you know, or undo this work, you have to pay us back. Um, so, yes, sir. Just a question. You, it's a, uh, two of the normal sources uh, or, or applicants would be municipalities or 501c3s. Right. Private 501c3s, do they, do they, they fall under this, this issue? Yes, absolutely. It's a, a private organization can be a nonprofit private organization or a commercial private organization. Um, so housing developers, a lot of housing is built with from nonprofit developers like Habitat or a community development corporation, but a lot of affordable housing is built by, you know, uh, Pulte Homes. My question, say a nonprofit housing uh, organization, would they be, because they're not public, would they fall under this restriction? Yes, absolutely. So whether they're for-profit or not for-profit. Doesn't matter. 501c3, period. They're a, fi they're a private organization. You're giving public money to a private organization. You've got to protect the public benefit in that and make sure it's used for so a you're public purchase. If it's the public, right? So it doesn't matter if it's public or private. No, he's well, saying and he, had, he, he had listed uh, municipalities and 501c3s. It didn't say or, or it's 501c3 nonprofits. Uh, but this is right where this is where, where you're really talking about, like a, a commercial develop, development or a for-profit housing developer. Well, no, I guess my question is, is a 501c3 nonprofit housing developer exempt from that anti-aid, or does it also nope. come through that? It's okay, still so. a private organization, right? So you got to... you so got to in both categories? Yes, the absolutely. The yes, yes, they are, actually. Yes. Um, oh, but it, That's confusing. You, yeah, but your example is yes. not a good one. Because whenever CPA gives money for housing, yeah. you're going to get a housing restriction back. I mean, that is the, why would you do that and not get the restriction back and, and contribute to your town's SHI um, and get credit from the state for having that housing unit? So housing is not a good example because that's a well-established um, procedure. You give money to a housing developer, they know they're giving an affordable housing restriction back to the state. It's the only way they can build an affordable housing unit um, and get other funding is to put a restriction on it. So in housing, that's, it's that's really immaterial. Way around the yes, yeah, in housing, you're always getting a restriction back. Um, it might not be a permanent restriction, it might be a 30-year restriction, but you're getting a restriction back because you're not giving that developer all they need to, to, to build the project. They're getting money from the state and the feds and they all require a restriction. So, Can all right. Back with one more question? Yeah. You, I know you don't want to talk about the church, the religious organization, but could you just talk a little bit about it? What would it take to get a, something approved for, like, a roof on a historic church? Yeah, it's really hard. Um, it's, it has surprised me. You read the decision from the SJC, and they don't seem to leave much wiggle room to do these projects. But yet, you look at you know, the last hundred religious institutions that have applied for CPA money across the state, and 95 of those projects have been granted money. So it's, it's really a difficult subject. Their, their decision was so muddled and difficult to follow. Um, it's, it's a problem. Um, and the only way to resolve that, we can't propose legislation because it's on a, you know, legislation doesn't trump a constitutional amendment. So we're, what we're really hoping 
is one of you gets sued for doing these projects. <laughs> and then it goes back to the SJC, and we get some clarification. Um, Steve, Steve has volunteered to be the pro bono attorney for that. <laughs> <laughs> Like, you know, having alcohol and meat there and all those kind of things. Right. Does that sort of count for it? It does count, but it's a, you have to follow what's called the Helms test. Yeah, Steve has bored us to death. Right. You have to follow the Helms test, which has three factors. And one of those factors you'd get credit for, the fact that it's used for non secular purposes too. But the other two factors might sink you, you know? Um, so. 95% of people just, they just do it and they just. Yeah, I, I am so surprised. You no, know, usually they send it to their town council. I think most folks are following our advice. Don't even, you know, accept the application, but don't even try to figure it out yourself. Send it to town council. Ask them if they can fund so the project. Don't just, don't say no. Go, go ahead and send it you again. don't want to say no, and here's why. This was a Massachusetts court on a Massachusetts constitutional amendment. There is the federal. Um, anti-establishment clause in the federal constitution. And there was a federal case right around the same time that came to the opposite conclusion that Massachusetts came from. And it was, uh, I think, to call the Trinity Lutheran case from the Midwest, where a church applied to a state program that was giving money to fix up playgrounds at schools across the Missouri, I think it was. And the church, the state said, no, we don't fund private religious organizations, their playgrounds, it's only for public schools. And they sued, and the Fed said, you're discriminating against that organization just because of their religion. You have to make that program available to everyone. So it's really the opposite of what Massachusetts, our um, anti-aid amendment is much stricter than the federal. And so if you reject the application, I mean, I, I sympathize for CPCs. You're between a rock and a hard place. If you reject the application, you could get sued by the religious organization for discriminating against them because of their religion. Um, so, so we have funded about four, I think four. <laughs> Would you, do, can you edit the, the, can you edit or turn off the camera while we have a, no, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. Yeah, um, um, and I think it, what's important is just to stay away from the, the religion iconology. Yes, so, that one is clear. There, if there was, if there was one, if there was one thing that was clear was glass windows, yeah, that one was clear. Jesus cross, then you know that window. So a roof. Covered. What about a roof, a roof on a historic structure? Yeah, that that works in your mind. Yeah, because oh. it's a historic, it varies. Right. I mean, structure, yep. I mean that, but that's what Acton said. Acton said, we're not funding this because it's a church. We're funding this because it's a significant historic exactly. structure. But the, the court didn't buy it. They said the religious, the anti-aid amendment trumps that. Um, so it's complicated, folks. Um, so. I read something, a case that you guys had on your website that was, the difference was, is that part of the church available to the general public versus like the actual like altar, like that's not? Um, that is a determining factor, but like I said, the Helms factor has three tests, so it would, it would qualify under one of the three, but you might get sunk under the other two. Okay. Um, the court did say one of the projects in Acton was also to fund two houses owned by the church that they rent out as affordable units. Yeah. And even though they were owned by the church, the court did seem to indicate the project, the money wasn't being given specifically to those, it was being given to the stained glass windows. But they yeah. indicated that, for example, if it had been for the completely secular use, even though it was owned by the church, that may be okay. They also said they left a little window open saying if the building is so hugely historically significant, and they gave the example of the Old North Church, you know, from our revolution. Um, and um, they have received money from a federal program, and they used that as an example. But they seem to say, you know, the litmus test was really high for historic significance, because frankly, these churches are all 
hugely historically significant. They're the fabric of a New England community, you know? So it was disappointing um, to get that decision. Okay, so now on to, um, uh, we did that. Now on to uh, um, how to determine if you are okay funding non-religious projects, <laughs> um, which is most projects. Um, so anyone recognize this chart? Um, so this is the CPA allowable uses chart. Um, this is a visual representation of section 5B2 of the CPA legislation. 5B2 is a gobbledygook paragraph that only a lawyer could love. And it basically tells you what you can do with your CPA money. Um, but it reads, you know, like you would never understand what it, what it said. And frankly, from 2001 to maybe 2004, when I was chair of my CPC, none of us had any idea what we were doing. Um, this was a brand new law. CPA had never been done before anywhere in the country. It's still the only law like it. You know, it was the Wild West, and we were figuring it out. Um, and then DOR took that paragraph and put it into a picture, and it was like, poof, like a thousand light bulbs. A picture's worth a thousand words. It really helped. Um, that doesn't mean it's easy to determine what we call allowable uses, but this does help. Um, so you want to keep this chart really handy. This is the simplified version of the chart. There is an official DOR version on our website. The only difference is it has the, the definitions of all these words in these boxes, the official DOR version. Um, so, um, you know, You'd think it wouldn't be that difficult, right? There's, we all know the four categories of CPA. It's a restricted program. It can only fund projects in these four categories. But it can't fund every project related to those categories. What's lesser known is it can only fund projects in these four categories that can be justified by one of these verbs. And that's the part that threw us all in the beginning. Um, so. To fund a CPA project, you have to be acquiring something, creating something, preserving it, supporting it, or rehabilitating it. These all have definitions for what, the, what they mean, except for create. There's no definition of create, but it's, pretty, it's the easiest one to understand. Um, and to further complicate it, not every box is available in every verb in every category. So the legislature did a good job you know, making this you know, as complicated as possible. Um, uh, so how do you use this chart? Um, and, and it really is the first thing you should look at. You know, if you're in the supermarket, you know, carry it in your back pocket. And if someone comes up to you and says, hey, Steve, you're on the CPC. I was thinking, could we, you know, contribute to the indoor pool? Um, you know, whip out your allowable uses chart and, um, and uh, look through and try to figure it out. Basically, the way you use this chart is you look through the budget for a project, and that's why it's so important to get a budget for your project. Don't let folks tell you we're just gonna fix up the park and we're gonna put in new, new teeter-totters. No, nope. you want a budget, you know, equipment, labor, um, you know, fencing, grass seed. You need the budget. Turf. Um, turf. <laughs> Thank you. Great. You were the person that brought up religious, right? Now you're going to kill me and bring up turf? Um, <laughs> troublemaker you brought from. Um, so um, the, the budget is, you know, it's not perfect. It can't, you know, at that point, no one has a bid out, you know. So what a rough budget. You need some idea. And then you look through each line item in the budget. And you have to find a box that justifies that line item. And if it says yes in there, you can do it. And if you can't find a, buck, a box that has a yes, or a yes if acquired or created with CPA funds, um, you can't do that, that piece of that project. So very often, some pieces of the project are OK and others aren't. And you just take those out of the budget. So for example, you're rehabbing a historic building. And you see a line item in the building for you know, new desks for the clerk's office. Well, desks aren't part of a historic building. You know, they're furniture, fixtures, equipment. It's called FF and E. That's not eligible. It's the historic building that you're re investing in. It has to be attached to the building, according to the definition in CPA. So you can still do that $3 million town hall rehab, but you're going to have to take the furniture line out of the budget. Um, because that's, that's not eligible. 
or the refrigerator for the staff kitchen, you know, something like that. Um, so that's, that's the way you use the chart. So let's give a couple of examples and, and dig into it a little bit. Um, let's say you s receive an applicant from the uh, select board to do what I talked about, rehab a historic building. They want to do um, exterior facade repairs and uh, replace the boiler in that in that historic building that the town owns. Okay, so step one, is that building eligible for CPA funding? And in the historic category, in the definitions of historic, um, it says that something to qualify for CPA funding has to be a building, structure, vessel, real property, document, or artifact. Is a historic building one of those things? Yes, it's a building. So that part, you've reached a conclusion that it's eligible. But it can't be any historic building. It has to either be on the State Register of Historic Places, or your historic commission has to deem it significant in the history, culture, architecture, or archaeology of the building. So I picked an example from the historic category because it has the most prerequisites for determining whether something's allowable. Um, so that's the first step. Is this particular building eligible for CPA funding? It's a building. And if it's on the state register, it's automatically eligible. If it's not, the select board the, or whoever is the applicant should go to the historic commission and present the details of the history of that building. The historic commission makes a ruling and declares it significant in the history and culture of our town. And they send a memo to the CPC chair saying, at the meeting of February 2nd, we declared um, Johnson Memorial Library significant in the history and culture of our town. Now you have an eligible CPA asset, and you can move on to step two of figuring out whether it's eligible. Now you go back to the chart. You've got an eligible asset, so you've qualified the category. Now you need a verb, right? So let's step through. Um, acquire is the first verb available in the historic category. Acquire means to buy something or, um, or lease something or acquire it by gift. Um, you already own that building, right? The town already owns that. So it's not justified by this box. The next box is preserve, and that's to protect the building from injury, harm, or destruction. Um, if there's a sprinkler alarm system in the budget, that would be justified by this. Um, uh, but most things that you're going to want to do when you're fixing up a historic building are in this box right here. You're basically rehabilitating the building. You're bringing it back to its former glory. You're putting it back together and making it, um, making uh, the necessary building code and ADA improvements to bring that into me more functional for its intended use as whatever the building is. So the vast majority of historic projects, this is where most of the action is on historic projects. Um, on open space projects, this is where most of the action is. You're buying conservation land. Um, in recreation, you're usually either rehabbing existing recreational assets or creating new ones, building new parks or new playgrounds or new athletic fields. Um, so, so Support uh, would be maintenance or what would support? Support is only available in the housing category. Okay. Um, and the reason for that um, is that the legislature knew that was going to be the most difficult category. And you'll notice there's the most verbs available of any category in the housing category. They wanted to give you as many tools in the toolbox to do that. Um, and support really has a very broad definition. Um, so communities have used support to do rental assistance programs, to hire housing coordinators for the town, to do housing production plans, to do perk tests on a piece of land that the town owns to see if it can, uh, can support a well or septic. Um, it's basically anything that is along the way to developing affordable housing. Um, because you know, when you build housing, there's five years of red tape and studies and requirements before you even get a shovel in the ground. Support can take you through those five years of all those pre-development steps. Um, all right, so we, we have step two done. We have a verb that fits this project. Now, when you've qualified that it's eligible, a lot of times folks say, OK, it's eligible. Let's send it to town meeting or send it to the city council. Well, that is not what a CPC's role is. Um, you know, determining eligibility is just the first step. Now the conversation happens. Is this a good idea? Is this a good use of our precious 
public resources. CPA is a pretty modest funding source, um, and it can't fund everything. So um, you don't have to recommend a project just because it's eligible. And I, I sometimes find CPC members don't know that. They think if it's eligible, it's got to go to town meeting. But the role of a CPC is really to you know, fulfill what the plan, what your CPA plan called for, to figure out what projects best fit the needs of the community that have been uncovered in the plan, compare it to other applications that cycle, you know, a lot of CPCs get more applications than they have money every year. So they have to figure out what to do by evaluating the projects. We have some CPCs that use scoring sheets, you know, and every CPC member votes and scores, you know, a project on 20 different attributes. Um, we have a couple of examples of those uh, from Groton and Greenfield on our website. How many times have you gotten an application and it's a mess? You know, it's just an idea. It's not really well developed. Um, it's very controversial. And no one really has you know, gotten the selectmen on board yet or the rec department on board yet. You don't want to fund things unless they're really ready for prime time. You don't want to put the CPC in the crosshairs you know, of a project. That's what happened and led to the revocation effort in Sturbridge. They funded a controversial recreation project that was going to take down some um, you know, trees in open space. And folks really got upset about that. And they said, you know, not only are we going to fight against that project, we're going to take out the funding source that was going to fund that project. So you don't want to put the CPC in the crosshairs of, you know, a truly controversial project or one that's just not ready for prime time. A lot of CPCs also want the applicant to not just rely on CPA. CPA is easy money. You know, it's, it's, it's your friends and neighbors sitting at the table. It's very hard to say no you know, to your fellow, you know, committee members in town um, or your, you know, very uh, strong town manager um, um, or, a, a, you know, a powerful select board member or mayor who's putting the squeeze on you. Um, so, you know, you definitely want to make sure that they're not just going for the easy money, that they've done the work to apply for state grants, maybe done private fundraising and that sort of thing. Um, you don't want to go overboard on that because other funding sources are hard. But if it's a nonprofit coming to you, you know, it would be great if you know, 10 or 20% of that project they agreed to do private fundraising for, um, because that makes the project that much more palatable to the town if they're doing that. So that's kind of how you use the project and, and, um, and arrive at a decision. Um, so now let's go back to the chart, and let's pick a project that wouldn't qualify for funding. Um, let's say you receive um, a, an application from the Historic Society to do an oral history video production of World War II veterans. There are only seven World War II veterans left in our town. We want to hire a professional video production company, film their stories, edit it into a half-hour program, put it on the local cable access, put a copy at the library, and use it in the third grade curriculum. Uh, and it's going to cost $20,000 to hire this video production company and, and distribute the, the tapes. So um, is that eligible for funding? Step one, right? Um, is, it, um, is it, you know, in the, um, in the historic definition, is it a building structure, vessel, real property, document, or artifact that you are creating or funding? I don't think so. Um, Really what you're doing here is you're creating a new video program. If you really look at the budget, what's the budget being spent on? Hiring a video production company to create a video. Um, it also kind of fits this category too, which is it's something that supports the historic category. It's definitely a historic project. Remember I said you can't necessarily fund every historic project. Um, and it fails the verb test too. You're not acquiring a building structure, vessel, real property, document, or artifact. You're not preserving one, and you're not rehabilitating a building structure, vessel, real property, document, or artifact. Um, someone did ask the other day if we had one of these tapes, and it was from 1951, and it was degrading, and we wanted to take that tape and remaster it and bring it back and you know make it um, Vi visible again, well, that would be eligible because the tape itself is a historic artifact. 
you know? Um, and if you don't do something with it, it's gonna, tapes don't last forever, they degrade. Um, so that project is not eligible for, for CPA funding. So, yeah, Bob. Where does studies fall? Okay, um, studies is a long, long answer. Um, uh, the first thing about a study is, it must be a study leading to an allowable CPA project. So I think it might have been East Longmeadow that years and years ago <laughs> had a proposal to do a study on whether a senior center could be built in town. Does that sound familiar? Was it Longmeadow? It could be Longmeadow. Was it Wilbraham? It was somewhere around here. Um, and they called, and we pointed to the, to the DOR guidance that says because the project can't be paid for with CPA funding, you can't build a senior center with CPA funding, a brand new one, um, you couldn't fund the study either. So that's the first thing. You have to ask yourself, is it a study that is going to lead to an allowable CPA project? Um, if it is, then likely you can study it um, and, and appropriate the money to the study. Um, but it would be a project just like anything else. The study would be the project. It would be like phase one of the project. So we want to build pickleball courts in town, but we don't know which piece of town land is the best for it. We want to hire a company to do all the engineering and figure out where to put these pickleball courts and cost them out and design them. That's phase one, and you provide the money for that. We call it a feasibility study. And then usually they come back the next year because all these projects, these studies all take a year. Um, and, uh, and then they ask for the money to actually do the project. That's usually the, the logical step for studies. Um, general studies like to study, well, housing general studies can fall in here, so like a housing production plan. But general studies to like, you know, examine, you know, all the historic resources in town and do a condition report on them, that's really difficult to justify because that's really support of the, of the category. Individual assets, it could be phase one of the actual work on that asset, but general studies are much tougher than specific project studies. So that's the best overall answer I can give you, but they're really very, these studies are very fact specific. The other thing I will tell you is, municipalities are famous for studying everything to death. Um, and every law requires 16 studies beforehand. Um, it's not exciting to your electorate who gave you a voluntary tax increase to see in the database that 16 studies have been done, right? Um, so we tell folks, particularly in the early years of CPA, don't go study happy. You want to you know, do some demonstrable projects for communities so they can really see what their tax dollars are going for. Um, and try to get the studies, to push away the studies and get, have them get other money. And then once it's determined that it's going to work, then fund the project, you know, the actual construction. Much better use of CPA funds because how many times do studies just end up on a shelf and never get used? And CPA is a pretty modest funding source compared to the 100% of the general fund for the town. It's usually better to do the study out of that um, and, uh, and then fund the actual project if it comes to be. So, all right, we're nearing the end here. Um, so this is our, you know, we've already had most of this discussion, um, but housing is the toughest category. It is the toughest problem in the Commonwealth right now. And I would tell you that CPA has received, you know, a fair amount of criticism over the past couple of years because we have some communities um, that, you know, haven't done their fair share of, of housing work. Um, and I do think that it's, we're already seeing it. Um, we're having to do a little work on Beacon Hill already. Um, you know, it's like the federal government threatens the airlines, unless you do something about these junk fees, we're gonna regulate you with those, you know, and we're gonna figure it out for you. So get your act together. I think we're seeing a little of that with CPA. We're seeing some, you know, um, some constituent groups and some advocacy groups who are wanting to make some changes to CPA. Um, for example, it has not been mentioned more than, you know, just once at the State House, you know, should we withhold the match from communities that are letting their housing reserve balance build up too high? 
Um, and we've been able to, to fight that off. We think local control is the biggest benefit of CPA. Um, and also, sometimes communities let their balances built up because they're saving it for one big project. Um, so there's no easy answer here, but I will tell you that it does see, housing is the one category where you really can't sit back and wait for it to come to you. You really have to be aggressive and out there and inviting developers and community groups, combing through the uh, to your meetings to talk to them and telling them and showing them that account balance and say, we've got money for you. You know, come to us with a project. To be pouring through, you know, the list of, um, um, unknown and unused parcels that the town actually owns that people have forgotten about. Every town has little bits of land all over the place, um, you know, and um, they've acquired it, you know, 100 years ago, and they barely even know they own it. You know, is that a great place where we could put a habitat house? Um, so it requires a big commitment and a lot of planning. Um, you know, the CPC can't do it alone, um, so forming strong partnerships with, you know, the local habitat chapter, if you have a housing trust, a housing partnership committee, um, even advocating at the select board for them to be working on this issue. Um, you know, it's, uh, the state's putting a lot of pressure on now for good reason, because we have a big problem in Massachusetts. Um, so, um, uh, moving on to, the, I have just have a, a number of final comments on, on different categories in CPA. That was the housing one. Um, the one thing I'll remind folks in the um, open space and recreation category is a step that some communities have missed, but whenever you buy a piece of land with CPA funds, whether it be conservation land or park land, parks, playgrounds, athletic fields, if you're buying the land with CPA funds, you must put a restriction on it. That's where a restriction is required. The example you asked about a restriction, you're just funding a rehab project that the restriction might be the best way to protect the public interest, but there are other ways to do that. But if you buy something with CPA funds, and there's been over 800 parcels across the state built with CPA funds, um, you need to put that permanent deed restriction on it. And the restriction um, you know, has to be held by a third party, the state, a land trust, um, a booster club, um, you know, a parks association, and that sort of thing. Um, and the state, you know, does, when you apply for state grants, they do look through your CPA projects, particularly at the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs, and they will withhold grants if you haven't done your CR. So it's really important to go through, you know, a lot of you haven't been on the CPA since the beginning, but there might have been a purchase in 2004, you know, that just fell between the cracks. And you definitely want to research that and make sure that all the parcels you bought with CPA funds in the recreation and open space category. You won't see too many historic parcels being burnt, uh, bought with CPA funds, and towns don't usually buy you know, uh, municipal housing either. Um, it's mostly these two categories. Any questions on that? So you said the restriction has to be held by a third party? Yes. Um, it's called the common law doctrine of merger. So when you buy a piece of land, what you're buying is the fee ownership in the land. And then you're also buying the right to do whatever you want with that land, right? So when you buy a piece of conservation land, usually the town wants to own the fee. They want to own the land, right? Um, but it also, CPA requires it to be protected as conservation land forever. And if the Conservation Commission owned that restriction that protected the land forever, and the selectmen started using it to temporarily dump all the highway dirt for the project, the CONSCOM holder of the restriction is not going to sue the select board. You know, a town can't sue itself. Um, yeah, well, in most cases. Um, you know, most, most towns, a board doesn't have ability to access um, a legal counsel unless the selectmen approve it, in most cases. Um, so you might be able to find someone, you know, pro bono. I know CONSCOMs have sued their towns before, but because those two, those two rights merge, the right to develop it and watch over the development and the right to own the land, you have to have separate ownership of those two. So the town owns the land, and then a land trust owns the restriction. The restriction is an actual document that says what can happen on that land, and the land trust holds the town's feet to the fire to make sure that they're doing it appropriately. So the land trust then be buying the, the 
rights to that? You, it can be done that way. Um, <clears throat> most times. Giving up one of the two parts. Correct, but you have to do it, and the land trust knows you have to do it. So in most cases, it's the other way. Usually the municipality has to pay the land trust to take on the restriction. On the because the restriction comes with some liability, right? You know, you have to enforce that restriction. So the land trust might have to sue the town, and that can get expensive. So usually they want a one-time endowment fee, maybe $15,000, it's not a lot, and they put that in a true endowment, and it's a legal fund if they ever, ever need it. Um, and they can use the interest from that endowment to do annual monitoring and you know walk the land and see what's going on there. Um, so it works very well in Massachusetts. We have great, we, have, we started the land trust movement in Massachusetts. The trustees of reservations were the first land trust in the, count, in the country. We have more land trusts here than anywhere else. We've got a robust land trust community. Um, and they do a great job holding CRs on town land. It can go the other way around. The land trust can own the land and the town can own the CR. And about 25% of the time, it happens that way too. So. Um, this is a requirement of CPA that the land be protected forever, um, and it has to be a separate organization to watch over what the town does. So, all right, um, moving on to the outdoor recreation category. It is for outdoor recreation, so that's a question we get sometimes. You can't build an indoor playground. It says no structures, no uh, stadiums, gymnasiums, or similar structures. So it's land as close as possible to its natural state, open land. Um, little tiny structures are okay if they directly support the outdoor use. So a bathroom, you know, you really need a bathroom to support the outdoor use or a storage shed, maybe a snack shop for the little league. But large structures are not allowable with CPA funds. Um, so we're talking about recreational land. There's a definition, you know, community gardens, trails, parks, playgrounds, athletic fields, tennis courts, basketball courts, pickleball courts, um, Ultimate Frisbee, what are those things called? Were you, Frisbee, uh, Frisbee golf, Frisbee golf uh, disc, golf. disc golf, thank you. Um, pickleball courts are the hottest one. Who's done pickleball courts here with CPA funds? Springfield? About You're about, about to, okay, <laughs> great. Um, so um, the restrictions are, as I said, no stadiums, no, no indoor facilities. We haven't had many lawsuits in CPA. The Acton religious lawsuit was one. Uh, the Norwell sidewalk lawsuit was another. Um, the Wayland and Weston um, artificial turf um, lawsuits and North Andover actually is the biggest one. Are the other, there haven't been many. What's that? Can we go into the artificial turf? Sure, let's start with this one. Um, Norwell wanted to use CPA funds for sidewalks um, and they were sued by their citizens and the court agreed with the citizens. Sidewalks are primarily a transportation asset to get from point A to point B. They're within the dedicated transportation right away. As soon as the town needs to widen that road, um, you know, or add another lane, bye-bye sidewalk. Um, so um, it's a transportation asset. It does have a use recreationally, but it's a secondary use to transportation. And you can't use CPA funds on, on sidewalks. Um, Unless the sidewalks are inside of a park, that would be fine, or inside of an affordable housing development that you're building from scratch. Um, turf? <sighs> um, There's a caveat. Yeah, if yeah. If you read the law, yes. it's, uh, what if it was created prior to 2011? Well, that actually doesn't really apply because no one's going to apply new for a project from before 2011. So, so, so project was installed and completed by 2011, and now it needs a new turf. You, you can't do it. There. You can't do it. The, the 2011 thing was an amendment for one project in Nantucket. Um, it was, they had approved it at town meeting, and then the CPA law changed in 2012, which didn't allow allowable you, right. turf, but they had already got it approved by town meeting. And so they filed um, a home rule petition to say that their project was okay. And it should have been okay. It was approved before the law changed. For some reason, the legislature, instead of doing it as a home rule petition, put it in the full CPA legislation. Yeah, because I was reading 
yet. It makes no sense for anyone else other than that, that project. But what happened was, um, remember I said 2012, we made some changes to the recreation category to expand it and give more flexibility, particularly to cities. Um, and um, at the hearing for that bill, unexpectedly, um, the anti-turf um, advocates came out and completely dominated the hearing because they feared that when CPA funds were going to be able to be used to fix up ball fields, um, that every ball field that's grass would be converted to turf in the Commonwealth. And turf is controversial. You line up 50 Harvard-educated scientists, they'll tell you turf is the greatest thing. It's environmentally safe. There's no um, greenhouse gases from the mowers. Um, you know, there's no watering and using of water. And you line up 50 Yale-educated scientists, and they'll tell you it's the worst thing ever. Um, it, you know, it uh, has heat effect. It causes cancer. And the jury's still out. Um, and it's very controversial. The legislature does not like controversy. Um, and so that delayed the bill, that hearing, uh, in, the, in, the fall, in the spring of 2006, uh, seven, delayed the bill for an entire year. And a compromise was reached. Um, and the compromise said that CPA funds can't be used to buy the artificial turf surface, but it could be used for other aspects of the project. So that was the compromise. Now, I will tell you that there was very recently a lawsuit in North Andover over this. And the court did decide that um, they interpreted that phrase in CPA to prohibit any CPA funds from any part of the project, not just the surface. And I think that amendment, that bargain, was a little naive. It was back in the day when we were thinking of turf as the carpet that rolled out. You remember the AstroTurf? And it was just, you couldn't buy the carpet. But now these are all multi-layer, you know, they're really complicated surfaces with many layers. And it really doesn't make sense to say it can't be used for the turf surface, because there really is no turf surface anymore. It's the, all these layers. So this is a developing area. Now, unlike the Acton lawsuit, that one was a superior court um, decision. So it is binding only on North Andover. It didn't go completely to the SJC and become binding on everybody. Did I do that right, Steve? Yeah. OK. More, more, or, less. more or less, yeah. But it, but it might have some precedential effect. It definitely does. Um, so, so it says on the fields. So we have a lacrosse wall. And basically, it's not a field. It's just a, a little practice wall that he bounced the ball off of. I think you'd be fine. OK. Yeah, and, and my town wanted to put artificial turf under a playground, you know, a small little area, because it's a nice, soft surface. Um, that's OK. It does really, it's really designed for the huge spanses of artificial turf on, on fields. It does say fields in the legislation. So we take it at face value there. Um, all right, uh, last topic tonight, um, which um, is near and dear to Wilbraham's heart. Um, which is when you do recreational projects and you're asked to fund them, CPA is really for dedicated recreation land. It is not for landscaping in front of the town library or putting benches on the lawn in front of the town library. Um, it's for land that is permanently dedicated to recreation. And it can be hard to figure out what land is permanently dedicated to recreation. Sometimes you have to go back you know, if it has a conservation restriction on it, then you know it's clearly dedicated recreation land. Um, if it's under control of the Parks Department, you can be sure it's protected recreation land too, but a lot of towns don't have Parks Department. You know, in our town, it's the DPW that takes care of our fields, but they also take care of our town hall um, and our parking lots and our roads. So what's dedicated and what's not? Um, the really the most, the best way is if you can go back and research when it was purchased and see if it was purchased for recreational purposes, because that's a common phrase in a lot of CPA legislation. Um, uh, or if it was for conservation land, it would say conservation purposes. But sometimes you're going back 110 years and researching a deed that's handwritten. It's very hard to find this information. Um, town meeting or the, the city council also has to vote to accept even gifts of land or to buy land. So there will always be a corresponding town meeting vote or city council vote to actually buy the land. And very often, if they're doing it right, 
they're specifying the purpose for which it's being acquired, for a, for a new school, for general municipal use as a dump, you know, for recreational use, for conservation purposes. Um, that's the most rock solid way. The, the deeds often don't specify it, um, but, the, but the vote of the legislative body very often does specify. Are you going to get into Article 97 at all? Well, these things all describe <laughs> land. Uh, do we have specifically? No. Um, these things all describe land that is covered by something called Article 97. Um, there's a Can couple of. How many towns are aware of Article 97 here in the room? Maybe there's one. Yeah, it's not that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. This, this floors me. Yeah, it's unbelievable. This is so critical. <laughs> Every town CPA needs to know. Yes, this. we're getting the word out. Um, it's an evolving area, and the state just passed a law to strengthen Article 97 two years ago. So it's really evolving now. Um, but just like that anti aid amendment, I don't actually know what number amendment that is to our state's constitution, but the 97th amendment um, was from the 70s, and it was Article 97, and it said, the Commonwealth citizens are entitled to fresh air, open land, and the pursuit of recreational happiness. It's a, it's a really small, you know, one sentence description, which basically has been interpreted to say, if land in a municipality is dedicated to recreation or conservation, there's a elaborate procedure for the town to do something else with that land. You can't just use it for something else without a two-thirds vote of your legislative body without applying to the legislature and getting a two-thirds vote of the legislature without doing an alternate analysis determining whether we can build that school somewhere else rather than building it on the park. And then it requires replacement land of equal size and conservation value that the town has to set aside elsewhere to be able to take that Article 97 land out of Article 97 protection. So, um, you know, communities really need to do a better job of studying the, what's on the land underneath their feet where you're funding a CPA project. If it's a building lot and there's a building on that lot, like the library, town hall, it's probably not con dedicated recreational land. Um, and we've had a lot of examples, um, and more and more, one just came up the other day, where communities invest in um, recreational assets, and then the town, because it wasn't protected land, it was actually general municipal land, the town decides to do something else. And then your CPA money is completely lost. You're not going to get paid back by the town. Um, and you've invested in something that is now going to be used for uh, um, you know, a municipal building or something like that. Yeah, right, Karen. So I'm just a little bit confused here. So say it's confusing. A park. <laughs> it is, yeah. So say there's a park and it, it just needs some love, okay? It needs uh, playground equipment. And the park is already established. It's been there. It's now just going to be rehabbed. Yep. It needs a conservation restriction? Nope. After, okay. Nope. All right. Absolutely not. It just needs to make sure that it's dedicated recreational land before you do it. So that park in Springfield is probably under control of the Parks Department. Correct. Any land under control of the Parks Department, automatically covered by Article 97. So that if the, you invest money, you fix it all up, and then the city decides they want to build a new DPW garage on there, they're going to have to go through that elaborate Article 97 process. So then what's the conservation restriction doing on recreational land here? It's a way to identify whether something is permanently protected land. If it's under control of the, conservation, uh, the Parks Department, it's permanently protected. If it ha already has a conservation restriction on it, you know it's protected, right? The document protects it. Um, oh, OK. All right. I, so, okay, I'm following it now. Yeah. That just kind of threw right. me off. To, just to do improvements on a piece of land, which is what most recreation money is doing with CPA, it, the, the land doesn't have, a restriction, doesn't have to have a restriction on it. But it has to be dedicated recreation land, and a restriction is one way to prove that it's dedicated recreation oh, okay. land. Does that make sense? I don't yeah. like you talking about this because you know, when we're talking about housing and then prices, and you're looking at towns like Forest, which has a lot of open space, and much of it is recreation land. People talk about 
Let's put housing. On that. Right. Yeah. Let's put the senior center on that. Please. Yep. Absolutely. And, you know, um, if it's not restricted, um, then you could. Yes. Um, and, you know, um, housing is a great need. But as we found out during the pandemic, open space and opportunities for recreation and getting outside are also pretty important to human beings. And if you cover every square inch of earth with housing, you know, people aren't going to be too happy. Um, does anyone remember the movie that gave me nightmares as a kid, Soylent Green? Does anyone remember that movie? Oh, yeah. Charlton Heston. Yeah. The earth is, is, is completely covered. Like, you know, it's, you know, 20, year, the year 2500, and there is no land left anywhere. We're all living on top of each other, um, and we're eating squares of sea plankton. Um, and that's the only food left. There's no open space. There's no fields. There's no farms. We're just processing these wafers of sea plankton. And when people go to die, they go into a studio and they watch um, pictures of what the earth used to look like with parks and oceans and you know um, the mountains and all that. Um, and uh, that movie scared the heck out of me when I was a kid. I don't know why my parents let me. It was scary, wasn't it? Um, please don't go watch that movie. It's awful. It's, it's, it's awful. Stuart, question. Um, if we wanted to use CPA funding for a playground at a school, um, school land is not recreation. Yeah. Land or anything. Yep. Is it allowed to use? Yep. Okay. So what about school property? Um, that's a great question. This entire thing falls apart on school property. And here's why. Before 2012, you couldn't fix up recreational land. So there were no school projects before 2012 because schools already all have you know, playgrounds, athletic fields, and that sort of thing. If you wanted to build a new playground and permanently protect it, that would have been fine. Um, and permanently protect it. And permanently protect it, yep. Um, because CPA so is for... permanently protected on... Well, I mean, there is, there is another way to get at it this. So you bring up two things. Um, Karen, let's say you want to fix up, you know, or, or build a new playground on a piece of land the town already owns that doesn't have a playground on it. It's not permanently protected. The legislative body can take a vote to permanently protect it, you know, to transfer care, custody, and control of that land from general municipal use to the parks department for use as a park. And then you could use CPA money on it. So there is a way, if the land is not permanently protected, that the town can change that use to make it permanently protected. Sometimes it's combined to transfer care, custody, control, and to appropriate $250, $1,000 of CPA money to build the park. Um, school property, because, well, let me answer his question first. OK. Um, so before 2012, no one asked the question you asked, because you couldn't fix up any of the school's recreational assets. The legislature changed the law in 2012 to allow communities to fix up recreational assets uh, on dedicated recreational land. But unfortunately, you know, sometimes the legislature does amendments that are not perfect. Um, you know, the laws have imperfections. Um, I, I have a list of all the imperfections in the CPA legislation, which um, I won't share with you. But, um, it was something they should have clarified in that 2012 legislation to say permanently protected recre recre recreational land or you know, school land that has been in, already in use for recreation. Because it's pretty rare for schools to convert recreational land to something else. But it does happen. So we are taking a little risk when we're putting CPA funds in school properties. Some communities require a memorandum of understanding with the school committee. Um, that says we're giving you money for a new playground at your school, but if you ever build something on top of that, you know you have to replace the playground somewhere else on the school property. Um, but it is it is a, a, a loophole or a gray area with CPA school projects. But the money still can be used. Yes, okay. there's no prohibition. Yep. So if we spent fifty thousand dollars adding clay to um, a school's ball field and then uh, that school is decommissioned and the town wants to build housing there, does that $50,000 have to come back? No, that's, the, that's the, the risk we're taking because most school recreational land is not covered by Article 97. It's school land. It's not 
dedicated recreation land. Although I would say um, uh, if you are replacing clay, like just the clay surface or whatever, that that's probably not an eligible CPA project because um, that, that clay needs to be replenished, you know, just like the wood chips in a playground need to be replenished on a regular basis. And CPA can never be spent for maintenance or ongoing operating costs. So I would say that probably is not a great CPA project. Right. We struggle sometimes with where's the line between maintenance it's and hard. improvement. It's hard. Yeah, and the definitions in CPA don't help you. Um, it's really hard, that, that fine line. Yes, sir? Okay, so if that ball field is lost because you're going to build housing on it, does the town then owe the town another ball field? No, because it's school, it's, he's, he's using an example of it on school property. If it was on dedicated recreational land, the town would have to go through the Article 97 process first before getting permission to build that housing there. But school property is school use. Um, so if the school wanted to build a parking lot there, or sometimes schools need a new school, they build the new school next door on the ball field and then replace the ball field on the other side of the school. That's pretty common. Um, it is fairly uncommon for schools to get rid of their athletic fields. I mean, most schools, if they have playgrounds or athletic fields, they need them. And so the risk is not great when you're doing a school project, but there is some risk. East Hampton spent $500,000 on a field, on a school, and then they built the new school on there and did not replace the field. Um, so, and same thing happened in Gloucester. So there have been a few examples, but um, by and large, you know, there's no problem with doing school recreation projects. The legislature should have thought that through a little more when they made that change in 2012 to make it um, not as much of a gray area. So, all right. Um, so basically, if you have land dedicated to recreation or open space, use CPA funds. But if the land is general municipal land, you should use general municipal money to, to fix that up. So that's pretty much what we have for you tonight. Um, and I'm happy to stick around and answer any other questions. I know it's, it's gone even later than we, than we said, but um, no one's left, so that must be good. Um, must be, uh, um, so yes. So you're all done, and, and maybe I can follow up with you after, because I had two questions under the housing uh, section. OK. Folks want to hear those, or you want yeah. to do those privately? Yeah, yeah. Okay. bring them out. <laughs> First of all, uh, the simpler one was, what was the, what's the rationale uh, for not allowing rehab uses in, the, in projects for the house? Oh, rehab? great question, and one which is the subject of great debate right now. So um, you see on the chart, and I'm covering it up with my arm right here, this box right here, because I hate that box, and it causes me to have no hair. Um, in the rehabilitation box, um, and in the open space rehabilitation box, it says no unless acquired or created with CPA funds. Right. So this goes back to the beginning of CPA. When CPA was first passed, all four of those boxes in rehab said no unless acquired or created with CPA funds. All four of them, including REC and Historic. So in 2001, Bedford, the first CPA community in the state, went to spend a million dollars to rehab their historic town hall. And town council looked at the article and said, I can't let you do this because you did not use CPA funds to build town hall in 1857. I can't let you use CPA funds to rehabilitate it because you didn't acquire it or create it with CPA funds. That made no sense to anyone. And so the legislature immediately changed the law and replaced that no unless acquired or created with CPA funds with a yes in the historic box. The reason why, um, I should have told you this before I go on, because I'm going to explain how we got the yes in the rec next. The reason why there was a no in every box was a woman named Barbara Anderson. Does everyone, yes. anyone remember Barbara yes. Anderson? Citizens for Limited Taxation was a very powerful anti-tax group um, in the 70s and 80s that got Proposition 2 and a half passed. They're the ones that got it done, and Barbara was a wrecking ball, a, a force of nature on, on, our, on Prop 2 and a half. Prop 2 and a half passes in 1980. 1990, Bob Durand, a state representative from Marlboro, files the first formal bill to create something called the Community Preservation Act. And it relied upon increasing taxes in a community by up to 3%. 
And Barbara said, no way, over my dead body, if you could use this new money for the same thing that the general municipal fund can be used for, we don't have Prop 2.5 anymore. We have Prop 5.5 in Massachusetts. And I fought too hard to get Prop 2.5 passed. I'm not letting the CPA thing add another 3% to people's property taxes. That's going to be Prop 5.5. So talk about the legislature not lighting controversy. Ten years it takes to pass CPA to get around this prohibition. And the way they got around it was to promise Barbara that, and Citizens for Limited Taxation, and the legislatures who you know, believed in, in that, that CPA would be for new things that aren't commonly in the town budget, buying, you know, buying land for new conservation land. No town has a line item in the budget to get conservation land. Most towns don't have line items in their budget for affordable housing construction. Um, most towns don't take care of their historic buildings. They let them rot. Um, and so the bargain was CPA will be for new stuff, but whatever you already own, you have to take care of under Prop 2.5. You have to figure out a way to get it into your regular budget, and the budget can't rise by more than 2.5% every year. So it made no sense in the historic category, right? How did that get through the legislature? You know, the, the historic category is all about fixing up buildings that are historic the town already owned. How did they not see that when they passed the legislation? How could they have allowed it to pass saying no unless acquired or created with CPA funds? Who would acquired or created a historic building with CPA funds when CPA was brand new? Here's what I think happened. I think the fix was in. Um, I think the legislature decided in the back room, anyone seen Hamilton, the room where it happened? I think the legislature decided in the room where it happened, let's give this win to Barbara and get this thing passed and we'll put the no in every category and then we'll go back and fix it next year and we'll change it and we'll allow it in the historic category. Um, because, you know, it was the first amendment to CPA and it happened nine months after CPA was passed. Uh, Marion Walsh was the state senator who filed that. So I can't, I can't, there's no legislative history records in Massachusetts. We're terrible about transparency on our legislative action in Massachusetts. Um, I think we got the worst ranking in the, in the country from some, um, uh, uh, a group about uh, the Sunlight Group, I think it's called, um, that ranks transparency in, in legislative actions. Um, uh, you know, the good news is, um, we might not have a very transparent legislature, but we have an unbelievably effective legislator compared to s the rest of the country and, and the way things are done. It's incredible how, how well it, Massachusetts is run as a, as a state. But anyways, um, in this case, um, that was changed right away. Um, fast forward to 2007, Newton is sued for appropriating funds to fix up uh, an existing park. And the citizens sued them. And they said, look, it says you can't rehabilitate a park unless you acquired or created it with CPA funds. You did not acquire or create Stearns and Pellegrini Park with CPA funds. And the town lost, the city lost the lawsuit. And that started a real hue and cry among all the CPA communities. Look, we want to do what Newton wanted to do. Um, and in that case, we had the data to show the legislature that the recreation category was not happening the way they wanted it to. Who's going to buy land for new soccer fields under Acquire or build new soccer fields when you have 15 dilapidated soccer fields and there's no money to fix them up? You're going to just ignore those and build a brand new one? So there was a real push among CPA communities. They said, look, we want to we fix this legislation and um, allow rehab of existing parks, playgrounds, and athletic fields. And so it took five years to convince the legislature. And in 2012, that big change that I talked about was to replace in that box no unless acquired or created with CPA funds with just yes in all cases. Um, so that's how that came to be. Now, the two categories that still say no our conservation land and housing. I'm finally getting back to your question. Um, but now you know why they're there, right? They were there from the very beginning in all categories. So they weren't changed. They, they weren't just changed. Never got fixed or whatever. Right. Now, 
The open space one should not be fixed. You don't, municipalities should not be mucking around on their conservation land. The whole reason it's protected conservation land is you don't want to do anything on it. So you don't want to give communities money to do something on it. So um, I disagree with that. Okay, um, but that's the, what the legislature thought. So the um, conservation land doesn't mean uh, unusable, you don't do anything. I mean, a lot of times you have to do uh, harvesting, tree harvesting, and stuff like and that. And you can do some limited things, like a beaver deceiver to protect the whole thing from flooding. Yep. You could do that in the preservation box. That's protecting the land from injury, harm, or destruction. Trail construction, that's actually a recreation project. You can create new trails, or you can rehabilitate the trails. So you can do certain things. But you don't want to give carte blanche to communities exactly. in that category. It's very difficult. The housing category, why is there a no in the housing category? And the reason is very simple. The legislature wanted to, CP is a very modest funding source. It can't do everything, and that's why it can't, you know, it has these verbs. It can't do everything in each of these four categories. There wouldn't be enough money. The legislature wanted to focus on the biggest problem in the Commonwealth, which is the lack of affordable units. We're over 200,000 units shy of what we need in the Commonwealth, and they saw that back in 2000. And they did not want CPA funds to be used to fix up housing authority properties. They wanted it concentrated on production. Housing authority properties are actually all owned by the state. They might be in your town, and they might be run by your housing authority, but your housing authority in your town is actually a state agency. Um, and the state has done a terrible job of funding rehab of their housing authority units. There's 43,000 units, and they're mostly in bad shape. It is going to change because today, is today Wednesday? Yep. Today, the House passed the housing bond bill that the governor had proposed back in January. She proposed $4.3 billion for housing in Massachusetts with a huge chunk of it, a billion and a half, to go to fix up housing authority properties. The House actually raised that to two billion, and they raised the total bill to six point two billion, and it passed the House today. But they're not looking to change CPA. To help that. There are people that want to do that. There is some pressure to open up that category, um, but, um, but not yet. I, I, I mean, frankly, I think you know CPA is pretty modest, and it's a lot easier for communities to put a new roof on their housing authority property than to do the hard work to build new units. And, um, and I do think that if that category was opened up, there's definitely a need there, but it's really the state's responsibility, not the town's responsibility. And it will hurt production. It clearly will, the money has to come from somewhere, you know? Um, it's a hard one though, because there is a need there. It's a huge need there. Yeah. So my second question was. Did I answer your first the, one finally? Well, I guess so. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's. Yeah. This can be it's four hours later, uh, and I answered the question. Yeah, I've been waiting. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the uses, uh, the other uses, the permitted uses, and looking at the definitions, um, it seems like a little gray in terms of the, the, the in, in terms of the details of where you actually determine a project's uh, purpose falls, whether it's in uh, support, whether it's in, uh, you know, preservation, or whether it's rehab. Is there somewhere on your site or somewhere where there's examples of those things? Because I, I can think of a number of projects where I could almost slot it, you know. A couple of different places. Yeah, it's it's very hard, and I'm shocked to hear you say there's a gray area in CPA. I'm just absolutely, I cannot believe you're an, you're saying that there's gray areas in CPA. Um, the best thing that you can do um, is to look at closely at the definitions of those verbs on the left hand side, and and most people haven't read those definitions. Um, any Are you saying in, in your statute? In the statute, yeah. That's what I was referring yeah. to. I, I still found. That I, could I mean, one yeah, a of and I'll explain why there's, there's that gray area actually in a second. Um, but every state law has a definition section, usually up at the top. It's very often section two of the law. Section one says what the law does, and section two is the definitions. CPA has definitions in section two. It's where the rubber meets the road on most pieces of legislation. So. You know, I could say I want, you know, I'd love for everyone to read all 17 pages of the law. Don't do it late at night, you'll fall asleep. But if you read anything, read the definitions because each of those words, except for create, 
has a definition and they are helpful, they're not perfect. And here's why they're not perfect. Section 17 of CPA says the Department of Revenue has the right to promulgate regulations on CPA. The way most state laws work is the legislature passes a broad state law. They can't possibly put in a state law every little nuance of the program. And then they give the right to a state agency to write the regulations to affect that law. And writing regulations is a very, uh, it's a process, you know. They have to write them, they have to publish them in the central register, they have to have public hearings, they have to have input, they have to, you know, then uh, take a vote on them. And, you know, it takes a while to write regulations. But everyone knows 40B, the chapter 40B, the state's housing law. The law is like one page. The regulations are, I don't know, 700 pages. <laughs> you know, that's where all the details are. There's never been regulations written on CPA. Um, I think the legislature expected that DOR would write regulations. DOR wants nothing to do with CPA. Um, the legislature usually gives a law oversight to a particular state agency. They didn't know what to do with CPA. If they gave it to the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs, what do they know about housing? If they gave it to Secretary Galvin's office, who does historic preservation, what does he know about recreation? So they gave it to DOR because DOR controls the trust fund and the money. But DOR was like, what do we know about housing, open space, acquiring land, historic preservation? So they've never written regulations. They, they um, you know, um, make it very difficult to, you know, they're strapped. They have six lawyers to handle every municipal law question in the state. Um, it's hard. And so that's why there's these gray areas. Um, and we try to do the best we can to fill those in. Um, but, um, you know, there's a couple of us and, you know, 196 communities. It's, it's difficult and there are no regulations to go by. Um, but, you know, it's not a total curse that there's no regulations. It's a blessing and a curse. And um, it's a blessing because CPA is flexible and you can use it to really get at your local needs. Um, and it's also a curse because it leaves you scratching your head trying to figure out whether something's right and getting yelled at by someone when Thank you, you make the wrong decision. So it's hard. Yeah, Bob. How will other CPA communities handling this new housing concept of wealth building with the issue of permanent affordability? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, Bob. Um, and, and you're talking about someone, you know, obviously someone of lower income that finally gets to own a home. You know, you there, want there, that. There, there are these programs, including funded by the state, where significant government money goes into building a house, selling it to an income eligible person, and after 15 years, who's ever the lucky income eligible person to be living in that house? the income restriction of, of ownership disappears. So it's affordable for 15 years. Right. And I'm just curious how other communities handle it. We, got, we had a proposal before us that we said we, if our money went in, we wanted 30 years. And our own local housing folks were not happy and convinced us that we should go along with all of the other funders who were only requiring 15 years. Right. So um, that is a local decision, right, as to how long the restrictions will go for. 15 years is pretty short. I don't know of too many communities that do it that little. Um, you know, 30 years or permanent is much more common. Um, but it's up to you folks. And the problem with CPA is, the problem with housing in general is, there are seven, you know, every housing developer has to package in 17 different funding sources and programs to get the money to do their project. And each of those programs wants to have their own goals fulfilled and has their own rules, right? So in your case, if you had you know, stuck to your guns on 30 years, they probably could not have accepted your money because your piece was much smaller than all the other pieces. Um, and so you did the right thing by going along with it. Um, 
and, uh, and that's usually what happens, but usually you don't see the pressure to do 15 years. Um, I mean, permanent is the preferred solution these days. I think the state learned its lesson when they first started doing affordable housing, um, and there were a lot of 30-year deed restrictions, and now every year we're losing 5,000 units, you know, while we're trying to build more new units, but we're losing 5,000. Um, some communities use CPA funds when they hit the term limit on the restrictions to buy down the restrictions again. And Amherst was about to lose 200 and some odd units at Rolling Ridge of affordability because the 30 year restrictions were coming due and the developer was gonna throw everyone out, rehab the building and uh, make it market rate. And um, the, the city of uh, town of Amherst Economic Development Department found a developer, Beacon Communities, who agreed to buy the building if Amherst would put in a million and a quarter dollars to help them make it affordable again. And uh, Beacon invested in the, in the building, bought the building, CPA money helped fix up some of the things they needed and um, give uh, um, Beacon a chance to buy that building and rebuy down all the restrictions. So that's a great use of CPA funds when you're about to lose um, units. Um, but that's a tough one. You know, that's one of the difficult things about the housing category. So, all right. Well, thank you all very much. I hope this was helpful. Um, happy to stay um, a little longer and answer private questions.